Tonight we ask, does our bold new submarine deal mean new risks for Australia? And is the tale of two cities now between rich and poor or vaccinated and unvaccinated? Welcome to Q&A. I'm Stan Grant. Good to be with you. Joining me on the panel, lawyer and human rights champion Mariam Vazade, Liberal member for Wentworth, Dave Sharma. Foreign affairs expert from the United States Studies Centre, John Lee. Shadow Minister for Families and Social Services, Linda Burney. And Mayor of Canterbury Bankstown, Carl Asfor. It's great to have all of you here. Thank you. Thank you. And remember, you can stream us live on iView and all the socials. Quanda is the hashtag, as usual. Please join the debate and share with us what you're thinking. Joining us also is Admiral Chris Barry. Now, he's in Canberra. He's the former Defence Forces Chief and founding member of the Australian Security Leaders Climate Group. And our first question tonight comes from Joey Young. So, here's what I understand of our policy with China at the moment. China, communist, bad guys, Captain Australia will join Captain America to save the world. I mean, I'll be very concerned if this is the limit of our understanding of our largest trading partner and our second largest economy in the world. And worse, we're jumping into an arms race because of it. I actually think ABC's China Tonight made more effort to understand China than DFAT. So why isn't DFAT investing the same level of attention and resources to building a comprehensive relationship with China than with the United States? How much of China we actually understand or know given we and our allies have been wrong in the past about China? Joey, thank you for those kind words about China tonight. <laughs> We're very proud of the show as well here at, at, uh, at the ABC. I want to go to Chris Barry first of all on this. And Chris, China wasn't mentioned today by any of the leaders by name, but there's no doubt in your mind, is it, that that's exactly what we were talking about? Look, I, I think the whole question is around the deterioration in our strategic circumstances on one hand and how we deal with uh, a major rising power like China on the other. But uh, to go to the point of Joey's question, if we're not using every element of our national power to try and avoid going to war, war instead of jaw, jaw, then we're making a very serious mistake. And that's what really worries me, that we sleepwalk now into the possibility of another war. Yeah, can I just start with you on that, Chris, though? Because, of course, there are, there are two sides to this. And we know from China and from Xi Jinping, he has talked precisely about war. He talks about being able to build a military capable of winning such a war and has made threats to invade Taiwan to reunify it with the mainland. Yeah, I think that's part of the problem, though, isn't it? Um, to go back to where I started this about uh, six years ago, you know, in the lead up to the centenary of the f outbreak of the First World War, I did the reading in The Sleepwalkers by Christopher mm. Clark at uh, Cambridge University. Uh, and Margaret Millen's book on the peace that ended... Uh, the war that ended the peace. And, 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 you know, what really strikes you is the similarity between the last great age of globalisation between 1895 and 1914 uh, and the signs of conditions we're now going through. So we're seeing, you know, a courageous uh, announcement by the Australian government today to, to go for nuclear uh, propulsion in our submarine fleet. You've seen the last uh, 2020 defence update announce that we're getting more and more concerned about uh, how we're going to deal with the whole question of rising China. Uh, and you've seen now on the stage the quad, uh, as well as these new arrangements that were announced today. So, you know, I just hope that we don't lack the strategic imagination to think there's a different set of outcomes here. And that's why I go back to my point. Mm. I hope all the elements of our national power are being used to try and make sure we never do have to go to war. Dave Sharma, you've talked up um, nuclear-powered submarines before. Why was this necessary? It is, a, it is an extraordinary step, isn't it? 
Look, I, it's absurdly a big step for Australia's defence capabilities. We've never had it before. The main reason why... Well, there's it's... only six nations in the world that do have this capacity and every single one of them have nuclear weapons and a nuclear power um, capacity as well. This, this, this is a, a, a crossing a real threshold. It's a big step, although I think South Korea is in the process of acquiring nuclear submarines and they, they don't have nuclear weapons, they do have nuclear power. Look, look, the main reason is because of our strategic circumstances. Um, the nature of our geography and where we need our submarines to operate means that when we were using diesel-powered submarines, it was suboptimal for the sorts of things we need a submarine to do. We need a submarine to be able to loiter at sea undetected for long periods. We need a submarine to be able to operate a long way from home. We need a submarine to be able to travel fast if need be. Uh, all of these things, a nuclear propulsed submarine does much better than a diesel-powered one. Um, so I think this is a recognition that um, our circumstances are such that we need to um, acquire this capability. I just make the point here mm. with our Air Force. We've always acquired the most capable aircraft of its generation. We're currently acquiring um, the Joint Strike Fighter. It's a fifth generation aircraft. It's the top of the top of the line model. Um, for some reason with submarines, we've never chosen to do that. We've always said we're going to have a conventionally powered one. I think all we're doing now is bringing our submarine capability in line with our other power projection capabilities. But John Lee, there has been a dramatic shift. It wasn't that long ago we were signing a deal with France and it wasn't for nuclear powered <laughs> submarines. Um, we've increased our military spending. All of the leaders today talked about the threats in the Indo-Pacific. What does it tell us about the trajectory that we are on now and the potential, the real potential for conflict with China? All this has happened, the increase in military spending by Australia, the focus of the United States on the Indo-Pacific and other countries like Japan, even the United Kingdom, that is all a response to what China is doing. Um, if you look at the last 30 years, and if the Chinese leaders say this, you have to believe them, they've been preparing for war for the last 30 years. Uh, for the last 30 years, they've engaged in the most rapid uh, rearming in peacetime in history. And not, it's not just about the capability, they've told us exactly what they want to achieve. It's not just Taiwan. Uh, they, want to, uh, they want a far greater presence in the East China Sea and they want a dominance of the South China Sea. Uh, so what we're seeing, the announcement today, but, but the events for the last few years in terms of where Australia and other countries have gone, uh, in, in national politics, every time uh, a country... Uh, takes these sorts of policies, there's always a response, and that is the response that we have. On the issue of conflict and war, I would say this, that we are sleeping our way towards a war if we do nothing about mm. it. The only way to prevent a war is to deter, because China is advancing. And the only way to deter China is to convince China that it would be a collective disaster imposed on China uh, should China provoke a war. Now, I know these are quite blunt and harsh words, but this is the reality of our regional situation. Um, and I would say that there is a far greater chance of peace if we are in a position to make things extremely difficult for China should it, uh, uh, should it decide on certain courses of action. Linda Burney, Labor has given some conditional support yes. to this. Interesting comments today from former Prime Minister Paul Keating, though, saying that this is basically selling out Australian sovereignty and saying that we should be looking at a more independent approach. Do you agree with him on this? Uh, Labor's position, as you, st as you say, Stan, is conditional. And it goes to nuclear weapons and it goes to the non-proliferation uh, treaty which Australia is a signatory to. Um, the, the, the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty that we're signatory to says that we should take all steps um, to eradicate nuclear weapons. How does that fit with now developing nuclear-powered capacity? Subject? Well, it fits within the Labor platform, which we've been very careful about today. Uh, the, my understanding is that the submarine deal, and let's remember it's the third one, not the second one. There was Japan mm. and then there was uh, France and, and now um, America, uh, is, is nuclear propulsion. Um, so our, our agreement to the policy is very conditional. But let's remember, Stan, that this is not going to happen till nine, uh, 2040 mm. 
and then there's one year for three years, as I understand. I'll be dead before this is rolled out, quite oh, I wouldn't frankly. be. I wouldn't be risking <laughs> that too quickly. <laughs> um, and the other, the other point that's really important, um, and I'm surprised there hasn't been more commentary on this, is that we've spent $90 billion already on the attack submarine deal, and who knows what the compensation is not, going to not, be not, not quite. Just, to just, France. Just, just quickly, Dave, we have to move on to our next question. I think no. it's about, I think it's what, about 400 million? Look, $90 billion was the cost of acquiring 12 and operating 12. But but if we Which you told us that. you were still doing a month ago. But I think the announcement today yeah. made clear that we're Super not going to Look, we, we, we want to stay with this issue, um, the big questions around China. Our next question comes from Carolyn Yarnell. My question is, do you think that rather than China's rise, it's the English-speaking West's reaction to it, with AUKUS being a particularly extreme reaction that may result in a self-fulfilling prophecy? Has Australia made itself more under threat by aligning itself so firmly with the English-speaking West? Has it also opened itself up to accusations of hypocrisy as it insists states it doesn't like don't nuclearise? Marion. I would love for us to maybe, uh, you know, learn the lessons of war. Um, now, I'll leave it to the experts to speak on the other points. One I took away from this was the cringeworthy moment when President Biden could not remember our PM's name. <laughs> um, I thought that was quite <laughs> offensive. Um, and it begs the question as to how close are we as allies if he can't remember his name? Yeah. I, I, I think you might know who Scott <laughs> Morris is, but there may have been a, there may have been a, sli a slip today. Chris Barry, th this... This overall question of where Australia sits, and we heard from Paul Keating today, several questions about Australia's yeah. interests and its values. The questioner there was, was raising this question about the Western world. Well, we are part of that. This mantra that Australia did not have to choose between China and the United States, that choice has been made, hasn't it? Oh, well, kind of, but uh, what really worries me, and it is in connection with the question that we've just heard about, uh, I wonder what the conversation in Jakarta is tonight. Uh, on our doorstep, we have a nation, uh, Indonesia, where uh, in 2050 the population will be 330 million people, the economy will be six times bigger than Australia's, uh, and, and the Indonesian culture is so very different to our Australian culture. Uh, and I would have thought when I go back and talk about our national power uh, that we should have spent a great deal of time talking to our friends in Southeast Asia and other Asian countries about uh, this coming on board and trying to build some understanding about why we think it's needed. Now, of course, one very important point to be made about uh, the nuclear propulsion issue is that the capability of those submarines will be no different than the capability of the other submarines that we were preparing to build. So it's not like at the operational level uh, of the deployments, what those submarines can do will be very different. So I think that's got to be well understood. What we're getting out of the announcement today are higher transit speeds, a longer endurance, uh, endurance to the patience of the crew and the amount of food on board yeah. uh, and the ability to be in the operational be areas better. Dave Sharma, Carolyn raises the question there about the English-speaking world, and I suppose she's talking more broadly here about... Um, the world that America has overseen, the so-called liberal global order and the challenges to that. The earlier questioner as well, Joey Jung, posed the question about what DFAT is doing, that we don't hear a lot about the diplomatic option, we're hearing a lot more about the military option. You were an ambassador, you'd worked in foreign service. Where is, where is DFAT right now? Where is the diplomatic option when we're talking so much about the military potential? Well... I can reassure Joey and others that there's a huge amount invested in the diplomatic effort with China. I mean, it's one of our biggest divisions in the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade. It's one of the places where we have the biggest diplomatic presence. Um, and, but, and right now, in a bit of a freeze, we know that our, our, our politicians can't pick up a phone and speak to their, our counterparts. So, right now, how is that working? Well, you, you need two sides to have a relationship, right? You need both parties to, to want to speak. Um, we've, we've said repeatedly, and the Prime Minister said as much today, we continue to seek dialogue with China. We continue to seek a constructive relationship with China. Neither of us is going anywhere. Uh, China is part of this region, so is Australia. We are going to trade, we are going to converse, we're going to have people who have ties and family links and commercial links there. So we need to find a way to get along. But 
The basis of getting along cannot be one country or other having to compromise its values, its integrity, its sovereignty or its political system in order to do so. And mm. frankly speaking, the sorts of things China has asked of us in our relationship in recent years is, is are things that no self-respecting, sovereign, democratic nation like Australia could ever agree to. John, I want to come to you just uh, for a moment on that, on that sort of question too about where our interest lies, our values lie, and how we navigate this moment. Just, just think on that for a minute, because, Carl, I, I want to bring you into this conversation, um, where you are, of course, there are very diverse populations and big Chinese populations uh, as well. Mm. We know after COVID uh, and the outbreak of COVID, there were complaints then about increased racism. Um, we know there've, there's been suspicion raised about Chinese Australians, particularly given the increasing tensions between China and Australia right now. Are you seeing this where you are and hearing this from Australian Chinese? Look, I think we, we're always facing the question of, of uh, racism uh, amongst all our communities. We're so multicultural and we work really hard to make sure that we're united, that we work together. And of course, when there are conflicts across the world, uh, we feel that here, we, it reverberates back into our communities. So we need to continue to work as a multicultural Australia, as, as one nation, to make sure that those, those feelings that, and the conflicts that are happening overseas don't impact our society here back, back in Australia. And John, just on, on that question that, that Dave raised and, and Caroline, our, our questioner raised as well, is navigating this moment, this is, a critical moment of history, isn't it? The 21st century was always going to be defined by this rising power, China, and what some see as a waning power of the United States. The post-American world is a phrase that, is, that has been in vogue as well. How do you see this critical moment and the role of a country, a middle power, like Australia? We shouldn't make the mistake of characterising this as a China versus America thing or a China versus the West thing, because Let's look at the simple mass in the region. China spends more on its military each year than the combined military budgets of Asia, South Asia, Oceania, the Pacific. Uh, countries in the region realise that there is no possible balance without the United States and its allies in the region. So the issue of our Southeast Asian neighbours were raised. You look at Indonesia, if you look at Malaysia, Singapore, Philippines, Vietnam, none of these countries want a dominant China. So it is not a West versus East thing. It is that countries around the region in the, in the, in, in the Indo-Pacific and beyond are extremely concerned by what China is doing, what it says it will do and what it's positioning itself uh, to carry out. On, on the issue of division in Australian society, particularly amongst Chinese Australians, we mm. have to remember that it was uh, Beijing, the Chinese Communist Party, uh, it's United Front activities which called upon diasporas in other countries to be activated and to serve the interests of the Chinese motherland. So it has been Beijing who has activated race, who has weaponised race, not the Western countries. But my broader point is this is not a thing of West versus East. This is concern about one country that is seeking to uh, impose itself uh, in the region and beyond. Our next question comes from Mariam Ganu. Since 9-11 and the subsequent war on terror in Afghanistan and in Iraq, it is estimated that more than 1.8 million Muslims have paid the price for a crime they did not commit. This does not include violence raining hard on Muslims around the world, with hate crimes already numbering in the hundreds, directed mainly at Muslim women. My question is, is the world less safer than it was in 2002 and have these events led to creation of more extremist groups such as ISIS? Mariam, um, we've seen the fall of Kabul and you've been involved in trying to assist people getting out of there and seeking refuge. That, that broader question that Mariam Ganoum raised there, mm -hmm. are we safer, in fact, if 20 years of war leads to the return of the Taliban mm. in Afghanistan? That's a good question. I don't believe we're safer. Um, <clears throat> I think the horrific events of 9-11, <clears throat> it caused, it wreaked havoc on so many. Um, the victims of 9-11, the, uh, the Muslim global community around the world that was tainted 
off the back of that. Um, <clears throat> and the hundreds of thousands of people that have since lost their lives in the name of the war on terror. Um, you know, if you that question really speaks to the heart of the issue, and that is that um, ultimately it's led to a climate of Islamophobia that's been very much normalised. In fact, that's why I started the Islamophobia Register um, Australia in 2014. Um, and it begs the question as to why we, I, I suppose, keep um, repeating this. And the thing for me is on um, the war on terror and the narrative mm. around that. It's something that's very much etched into the psyche of a lot of um, Muslims. Uh, there are some generations um, that for all they've known, all they've known is a war on terror and that narrative that's been peddled off the back of that. Can I just mm. stay with that? Because, of course, we see the 9-11 attacks orchestrated by Osama bin Laden and al-Qaeda, that he says in the name of Islam as an Islamist movement. Um, and it goes to something that we've seen play out since. You're right. So many, overwhelmingly, the people who have, who have suffered through the various theatres of war have been Muslim people themselves. But it goes to that struggle at the heart of Islam, doesn't it? A, a, a battle within Islam that the likes of Osama bin Laden and others have waged. Um, for what the religion represents. Talk about that struggle within, within Islam itself. Look, I, I wouldn't necessarily frame it like that. There, Historically, there are um, other faith groups who've had similar challenges and it so happens that this is mm. the one that uh, has dominated, you know, the last um, 100 or so years. But it's certainly not something unique to Islam. Mm. Um, we have made this point for decades and, frankly, I'm not going to, you know, harp on about it any further than that because I think that, that narrative in itself can be really quite dehumanising. And what it does is it, it perpetuates this idea um, that somehow, and this is the, goes back to the questioner, um, that, you know, Australian Muslim women who are highly visible, that uh, bear the brunt of Islamophobia <coughs> or, you know, or Afghans in, in Kabul right now, some of my own family included, they are bearing the brunt of what is being peddled as this narrative of, um, you know, Islam being connected to terrorism. I mean, that's frankly just not true. Mm -hmm. Carl, again, in, in the population that, that you represent, there are people, as Mariam says, who have grown up, people who are 20 today, who have known nothing but the war on terror. How has that played out? And what, what do you hear in terms of what Mariam says there, the stigmatisation, um, the stereotyping, um, the associations and assumptions that are made about a particular group of people of faith? Look, I think it's, uh, it's really challenging. It's challenging for for our community. We have 20% of our community in Canterbury Bankstown of the Islamic faith from all different parts of the world. And we're con continuously working to make sure that there's peace and harmony in our community. And we do that through programs, through important community leaders, through making sure that those uh, issues and concerns and wars that are happening overseas don't reflect or don't impact on our harmonious society here in Australia. And it's a hard work. It's not a job that you can just do. It's continuous. We do it all the time um, at a local government level. And I know that's, uh, you know, a view that's shared by Islamic community. They, they do feel they're victimised, they're targeted. And it's unfortunate, but it's also uh, occurs to, to other communities as well. And, mm. you know, the question is, you know, are, are our civil liberties at risk with, with the war on terror? Uh, my, my view on that is um, sometimes we have to give up some of our freedoms to make sure that we're safe. Mm. It's just finding that balance, and balancing that is really difficult. We'll be coming back to that question as well mm. about, about COVID. Chris Barry, that overall question, are we safer um, now after the war on terror? What did you see in the fall of Kabul? What did that represent for you? Uh, to me, that was uh, a, a horrible picture of... Uh, what we tried to do in Afghanistan really falling apart at the last moment. Uh, and the only thing I can draw from it is talking to uh, some of the uh, Afghans that were, were able to enjoy the freedoms over the sort of 20-odd years that we were there. Um, you, you wonder uh, what their future really looks like. But to go back to the origin of the question, I don't think we really know the answer to that question yet because... Um, the Taliban's uh, governance is sliding all over the place. Uh, we're hearing all sorts of stories that we don't like, uh, but we're being told promises that things will be better. We'll have to wait and see. Uh, so that is hugely disappointing. And, you know, I, I felt personally very sorry for a lot of the Australians who went to Afghanistan to try and secure a better set of outcomes. 
Uh, and, of course, I was the chief when we first went to Afghanistan in uh, 2001. So uh, I felt a personal uh, involvement there. To go back to the question about the global war on terror, I think that's a terrible term. Uh, a terrible term to use the word war about anything that isn't actually war. Uh, and uh, I also go back to that period I spoke about earlier, uh, the last great age of globalisation, 1895 to 1914. You know, assassinations took place all through that period of people like presidents of the United States, two premiers of Spain, bombs were thrown onto the floor of the Opera House in Paris. Uh, I mean, the whole idea that... Uh, uh, people who get really cranky about the current status uh, quo want to do something about it and take violence into their own hands is no different today. But if you read David Kilcullen's take on this, hmm. he is absolutely convinced that the war on terror, as we've executed it since 2001, has made more disgruntled people than we had on the planet before. So that means we need to be more aware, more conscious, and to go back to uh, what, the, what the mayor has said in his local government area, we need to work assiduously in our communities to make sure that we're on top of this game. John Lee, I might just get a, a quick comment from you before we, we move on um, to our next question and uh, what this moment represents as well. The point has been made that while America has been involved in this ongoing so-called war on terror, a war without an exit strategy, if you like, China has seized the initiative in, in its own region. Do you see this pull-out of Afghanistan as part of a broader realignment by the Biden administration to look at where the real security or strategic threats it believes may lie? Well, the Biden administration always promised that they would focus on the Indo-Pacific as their primary uh, region or primary region of interest. But having said that, um, the, the pullout from Afghanistan or decision to pull out, it didn't have to happen. You could still focus on Indo-Pacific because the, force, the American forces in Afghanistan were relatively small. It didn't detract from the resources that America is looking to focus in the Indo-Pacific. And yes, I can understand that Afghanistan has been a 20-year uh, 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 20, uh, well, war. Um, there was no prospect of victory as such, if you want to use that word. But pulling out, I think, created a worse situation than keeping a sparse force in there. And now you do have the prospect that Afghanistan may be used uh, as a base for another group that may want to harm uh, Americans or other countries. Um, so I, I don't think Afghanistan was a wise decision, but I don't link it to uh, what's happening in the mm. Pacific. That was always going to be the number one priority. But Marion, by, by the way, how is your family right now? I know you're in pretty constant contact and, yeah. and efforts to try to, to get people to out, out of the country if they Yeah, if they I wish. appreciate you asking, Stan. Um, they are basically contemplating whether they should try and remain in Kabul, where it's mm. uh, very dangerous. In fact, one of the family members back um, in Herat, the, uh, the father-in-law was actually... Um, uh, taken. We we don't know where his whereabouts are. Um, we they haven't received a ransom note, so they just don't know um, what to do, uh, whether to try and cross the border, whether to stay. But I do want to make this point, Stan, that when we talk about all the efforts um, and the 20 years, you know, it's it's taken what four presidents, trillions of dollars, um, countless mm. uh, lives lost just to replace the Taliban with the Taliban. And I think this idea. Um, you know, one of the guises and under which we went to war originally, this uh, women and children. We speak about women and children. I want to tell you what I've been hearing in the last week. Um, a, a, a woman, a 30-year-old woman named Farwa, um, she was shot by the Taliban after attending that protest. So you, would, you, you might recall you would have seen some images of uh, Afghan women protesting. She was shot by the Taliban days after that um, and she had her seven-month-old baby in her arms um, and she she is the sister of a local Australian um, Afghan man mm. who lives in Swan Hill and he's been trying to get his family out but uh, unable to. And so this, this idea of women and children, the guys under which there was Western intervention, I mean, one of the guys is... Where is all the attention now when it comes to women and children of Afghanistan? They are literally, every day that passes, their lives are in danger. And I've just it just begs the question, Australia's got a responsibility. 
we, we, uh, we haven't done enough. Um, people are at immediate risk. The US and its allies, um, you know, they've tried to justify this war. Um, and, and then I just want to pick up on another point that was made mm. earlier about the veteran community. And I know that the veteran community in Australia are traumatised. I know that many of them actually have come out in support of the statement that we, um, we've made on Action for Afghanistan, which is a website you can go check out. Many of them come out in support. But it needs to be said, and it, our accountability cannot be absolved. There is the Berriton report. There are the allegations that have come out in that. Despite our incredible efforts in Afghanistan, we cannot ignore that report mm. and all that it says. And of course, as you say, we're talking about 20 years of war. In Afghanistan, it's 40 plus years exactly. um, of war. We're going to say goodbye at this point to Admiral Chris Barry. It's been terrific to have you on the program. Thank you so much for being able to join us. A great pleasure, Sudan. Thank you, Chris. Move on now to other topics, and our next question comes from Oliver Lindholm. How do you feel about government policies that lead to the establishment of a permanent underclass of unvaccinated people with fewer rights in this country? Carl. Well, look, I, to answer the question, it's concerning what's going to be happening in the next month, two months, uh, the next uh, foreseeable future with with two classes of people, effectively. We're going to have a percentage of people that are unvaccinated and the majority of people that are vaccinated and their, their consequences and their rights are going to be different than everyone else's. And my concern, and I've, and I've raised this a number of times, is how are my small business owners going to be able to police who can walk into their shops? They can't afford... They've been smashed enough with this COVID and the shutdown and the lockdowns. How are they going to police that? And when I raised it with the Premier, because my, my idea was that there needs to be some government clarity, guidance for, for the 33,000 small businesses in Canterbury-Bankstown. Uh, her answer was that they should call the police. I, I don't think that's good enough. I think we need more than that. I think they, they need to, some protections to make sure that they're able to deal with that because they don't want their businesses suffering any more than they have when to. When we talk about, about two classes of society, we've heard this throughout, haven't we? Um, particularly with the restrictions and the way that restrictions are enforced. Tell us about how you've seen that from your no. community and what your community has seen when it looks at how other parts of Sydney may be living. Well, we saw the pictures on the weekend of Bondi and Coogee in the eastern suburbs beaches and, you know, I don't begrudge anyone that lives close to the beach to be able to go there, but when we are stuck at home and we only... We didn't have any hours of recreation, it makes my community angry, frustrated. I mean, we're fatigued after 11, 12 weeks of lockdown now, not being able to go outside. It, it really does hurt and it shows you a double standard a double standard in policing. Um, people there weren't, weren't wearing masks, weren't social distancing, mm. yet when uh, someone in my community attends a funeral yesterday, wearing a mask, social distancing, they get arrested and taken by police. Be be because there were excess numbers? Because there were more than 10 people at the funeral. Now, they were both breaching the health order. One gets arrested when they're grieving and the others get to sunbake. I mean, it just doesn't make any sense. Linda, it, it is difficult, isn't it, when you apply and there have to be benchmarks to these rules. You have to say, OK, it is X number of people or X number of hours that you can exercise or whatever it may be. Enforcing those things are so difficult and, of course, people feel as if they're being victimised throughout this. In your own area that you represent, are you seeing also this... This two cities? I am absolutely seeing two cities. The area that I represent, uh, four of the local government, three of the local government areas out of four are actually, um, are actually those, those red zones. And what I'm hearing from people, and I've had a lot of interaction with individuals, um, mm. including uh, Carl over the last week or so, there is an absolute feeling of two cities. Uh, one where you see people going to the beach, the other where you've got helicopters flying over you with mm. loudspeakers, and that's the reality. Uh, the other thing that I'm hearing very much in our area um, is people feel un unappreciated. There's been no recognition of the enormous efforts including from the Islamic community uh, to counteract um, COVID. Um, and I actually think that the Premier was absolutely tone deaf at the beginning of this to the multicultural nature 
of the area and I just hope, I hope, Stan, that politics doesn't come into it. I really do. Linda and Carl, both of you have had to get um, permits, right, to even come here tonight mm. um, to, to be part of part of this conversation? Uh, travel permits, mm. yeah. Um, I think they're called mm. movement permits, yeah, aren't they? Yeah. And um, you've got to apply, apply for that's, them. That, that's coming out of the lockdown areas, the LGAs are concerned. Yeah. Dave Sharma, you live near the beach. Um, is this what you're seeing, um, the type of things that Carl's talking about? Well, obviously, I've got tremendous sympathy and respect for uh, Carl and Linda and their communities and the resilience they've shown in going through this, and I can't pretend to know uh, what it's been like in those LGAs and the, some of the, the lockdowns they've had to endure. And I'll, I'll be honest, I mean, in, in living conditions that... You know, they don't have access to a beach nearby. It's not within five kilometres of them. Some people are living in high-density houses. A number of them are essential workers who can't work from home. They're dealing with homeschooling as well. It's tough. Look, the lockdown's tough on everyone, and I think it's been especially tough on um, on those those 12 LGAs that Carl and Linda represented have felt this more than others. Um, look, I hope we're not... Um, going to see an underclass uh, emerge in society. I don't think we are. I think this is certainly putting a lot of pressure on communities. And understandably, people are angry and resentful and frustrated about what's going on. Um, but I think, you know, we are on the way out of this. Um, there is light at the end of the tunnel. And I hope at the end of this, I'm sure we will, we'll all consider ourselves Sydney siders. Surely the question, again. Dave, is how do you put it back together? Yeah. Um, at the end of the tunnel, <coughs> and that's the real challenge that's going to lay ahead mm. of people in this city. Mm. We're going to stay with this. Um, our next question as well comes from Amar Singh. As a community leader and a charity worker, I'm deeply offended and appalled by the ongoing lockdown at mainly migrant communities in the southwest and western Sydney. My question is, are we hurting our nation's proud multiculturalism and harmony? What will we, the next generations, think? How we treated our own as second-class citizens? One side of Sydney is thrown to the ground for not wearing a mask, and the other side is let loose to enjoy life. We need to show solidarity within New South Wales. This just doesn't pass the pub test. Mario. Mm. Um, I think I think Amar is right, and I think this th there is this postcode privilege, right? And some of I mean a lot of this existed well before COVID, and what we've seen happen during this pandemic is those those uh, it's just being brought into sharp focus. So some of the issues that you brought up, Dave, and you know we talked about this the, this idea of uh, they are battling. There are there is an undergrad. I, I think there is a, two two sort of societies being created here, and. I'm not at all suggesting that this is easy to get right from a policy perspective. Mm. It's incredibly difficult. I acknowledge that and I don't envy those who have to make these decisions. However, um, this roadmap out has to be an inclusive roadmap. It needs to take in into account there are in entrenched inequities across multiple communities, including the Indigenous community. And how do we ensure that we bring everyone on the journey um, so that by the end of this, the entrenched inequities that already existed um, um, you know, they're just going to be far worse and how are we going to tackle it at that point? Carl, how do we deal with that when we know that different parts of the city have different rates of, of COVID infection? Um, and we know that in the higher rates, uh, there is a, a, an also a, a proportionate response to that. We saw in the northern beaches of Sydney last year at Christmas, they were locked down during Christmas when the rest of the city could move around. If, as Mariam says, you're going to move to a lockdown, an inclusive lockdown, how do you do that when we already see that parts of regional New South Wales that have come out of lockdown are back into lockdown because there's been another outbreak? Yeah, look, it's, it's been tough. And I, and I admit that the Premier's got a tough job, but the reality is having a tale of two cities isn't one in all in, isn't we're all in this together, which is what she's been preaching. We, we're seeing people uh, in my community stigmatised now by other parts of Sydney, something that they can't get work, they're losing contracts because no one wants to, to hire a, a plumber or an electrician from my part of Sydney because they might have COVID. I mean, we have co high case numbers because 80% of our workforce in the 12 yes. local government areas are the essential workers that are servicing Greater Sydney. 80% stand. So and they're I, having to move around. They're moving and around and they're, and they're either catching the virus when they're at work or they're coming home and, and spreading it or vice mm. versa. But, but the discrimination where we're mandating a vaccination for, for a tradie that lives in the, in the local government area hotspot and, and 
not if they don't. And then they're working on the same site. They're working next to each other. But there's different rules for different people. Mm -hmm. And that really irks my community. It makes us angry that we're being treated this way. We had a curfew that the Premier, by her own admission, said doesn't work. And then she brings it in for half of Sydney or for 2.2 million people. It was arbitrary. It didn't work. We had helicopters flying overhead, waking people up. I mean, it's just not... It wasn't fair to begin with. And I'm glad that she's lifted that curfew. Otherwise, maybe I wouldn't have been here tonight. Mm. <laughs> we, we're glad. We're glad it has been lifted. You can drive home in safety tonight. Our next question comes from Anne-Marie Bumerhi. In the UK, Canada and France, people don't need a vaccine passport to attend a place of worship. But as their governments recognise religious practice as essential, our government proposes to permit only the double vaccinated to exercise the freedom to worship. This non-essential view of religion is disproportionately affecting LGAs that have already suffered the harshest lockdown and are among the most religious in the country. As we head towards Freedom Day, should our government recognise religious practice as essential and protect worship as a fundamental human right? Dave Sharma. Well, look, absolutely, worship is a fundamental human right. Only, only if you're vaccinated, because you won't be able to go uh, to services if you're not. Well, I, I think it'll firstly depend on the level of vaccination and the, and the policies that churches or other religious groups um, impose. But, but, but it's not the churches or religious groups that will be imposing them. It's the state governments who are mm, saying, absolutely. once you reach a certain vaccination threshold in the population, yes, you will be able to go and worship, but you've sure, got to be vaccinated to do that. Yeah, yeah. So, it's, so it's, not, it's not a right. No, but I, I'd make this point. This isn't singling out any particular religion or religion at all. This is true for any mass gathering or events. You'll only be able to do certain things under state government policy if you are double vaccinated. So churches and religious groups and places of worship are not being treated any differently from any other large gathering of people here. Um, and We've had this throughout. I mean, we've had, you know, it doesn't matter whether your funeral is Islamic or Jewish or secular, you can only have a certain number of people there. It doesn't matter if your wedding is one faith or another, you can only have a certain number of people there. I don't doubt that it's imposing hardship, but, I mean, the question that referred to the examples of the UK and, and Canada, I mean, there's 32,000 new cases a day in the UK with a high level of vaccination. There's 4,500 new cases a day in Canada, on average, with a high level of vaccination. Um, is that what... Where would we be comfortable with that level in Australia? I suspect not. Um, and these are the decisions we all have to take collectively as a society. But we've taken the decision, and it has imposed hardship on lots of communities of faith, that this is too dangerous a time to be risking outbreaks and people have to sacrifice that, that Linda, level would, of worship. would you be comfortable with places of worship turning people away if they're not vaccinated? It's really interesting we're having this discussion because um, a minister of a Christian church, I had the same discussion with um, just yesterday. Um, and I think that what's really important, Stan, is that we recognise that religious leaders of many faiths have pay, played an amazing role in this pandemic. They've cared for their, um, for their congregation, um, the, um, the Muslim Association set up the pop-up clinic in uh, Lakemba. in Lakemba, which was incredibly successful. So we need to recognise that they have played a, such an important role and faith is important uh, to many, many people and it is a human right. I actually think that vaccine passports are inevitable um, and whether we like it or not, the Premier's bring them in by stealth anyhow by precisely what we're discussing So you'd be now. comfortable by, with saying that if you haven't been vaccinated, then you won't be able to go to a place of worship? I, I think that we need to have that discussion, Stan. Um, uh, and the, the, the question has said, is, you know, it should be an essential service. We haven't had that discussion. Uh, but it is clear to me uh, that um, many freedoms uh, that we once understood will mm. change, including going to a restaurant, going to a, a, a concert, 
um, a whole yeah. range of other but things. going to a restaurant and a concert is different to going to a place of worship where you may be seeking support and solace through what is a very difficult time. J John Lee, you've written about this, this challenge overall to democracy, how we understand it, the rights and liberties that people have within a democracy and what we have to give up during an emergency. If you look at how the past 18 months, two years have played out, how are we faring in Australia? Well, not as well as I, I would have hoped, I would have to say. I mean, it, we are a democracy and when governments um, propose to uh, disrupt or suspend the basic rights of its citizens, there is a heavy onus on the government to be transparent about its reasoning, um, to mm -hmm. make sure its policies are accountable and are contestable. But if you look what's happened, and I'm mainly speaking about state governments because they're the ones imposing most of the rules, um, you know, we hear two lines uh, every day. This is the health advice and this is our modelling. Yes. We're never really told the reasoning behind health advice. We're never really told the assumptions behind modelling. Mm. And certain obligations or certain rules are then imposed onto populations. Now, if, if, if you look at the complexity of the problem, democratic governments have to balance different risks, different rights, different interests, and they've got to have a conversation with a broader group of people beyond chief health officers and bureaucrats. Mm. That hasn't happened, and I, th I sense it's led to a lot of the anger that's obviously been expressed in this program tonight, but it's also led to poor policy decisions. Uh, you know, when was the last time you heard any Premier of any state admit they got something wrong, which clearly, occasionally, they do, because they're fallible? but there is no real improvement or refinement of policies because there's very few incentives to do so uh, when you don't have the transparency. So for me, that's not how democracy works. That's how authoritarian governments tend to approach problems in a very singular or single-minded manner. Uh, I, I, I think that, I, I'm not trying to claim we're authoritarian, but I think there has been a creeping authoritarian approach mm. to managing what is a very difficult problem. Now we're talking a lot of course about vulnerable communities and those communities at risk um, during the, the COVID pandemic. And that leads to our next question. It comes from Biami Williamson. Biyama, the 2019-20 bushfires exposed enduring inequalities borne by Aboriginal people. Issues such as intergenerational families, in overcrowded housing, poverty, chronic health issues, and public servants who lack the skills to work with Aboriginal communities deepened and made worse Aboriginal people's experiences in the bushfires. These same inequalities and issues are now being exposed in the COVID-19 outbreak in Western New South Wales. The government likes to reference hindsight, but isn't it a matter of foresight that dealing with entrenched issues of inequality are needed to create a more resilient country and ensuring that people who are already marginalised in society don't experience additional trauma in times of disaster? Linda, it was only earlier this year that we were praising the response, weren't we, and saying that the Indigenous community, which may have been absolutely vulnerable to the impacts of COVID, had avoided the worst of it. But that has really changed. What, what's gone wrong? Uh, I tell you what's, what's changed is the uh, success in the early part of the pandemic was due to communities and particular uh, Aboriginal organisation, uh, the Archos and the Land Councils, mm. actually closing communities down, the remote communities. Much more difficult, isn't it, this time around when you're dealing with Western New South Wales communities Western New in South bigger towns? Yeah, Western New South Wales and far Western New mm. South Wales. And Yama, Biami, um, is the numbers are just going up day by day. And Stan, I would go as far as to describe, to describe this as a major administrative bungle. Um, From who? This, this, but by the federal government. A lot of this was to do with vaccine availability. Um, and then there was a mad scramble and an emergency suddenly is coming out of Dubbo um, and, and, and further west which could have been avoided. Um, I have spoken to people on a daily basis from those communities. When this started, Burke was 2% vaccinated, and yet we were told that we were 1B of the vaccine. Well, I was, I was going to say that, Linda. Um, Indigenous people were prioritised. So what went wrong and how much of this, and we've heard this phrase being put around, was a hesitancy? 
in the community? Well, two things there, Stan, and I, I don't want to dominate too much. Uh, I get very cross when I hear the narrative that's been put around about vaccine hesitancy. If there's vaccine hesitancy, then there's something wrong with your messaging. Um, and it was just amazing to me that the federal government can produce uh, in 13 Indigenous languages about the cash debit card, but manage seven about COVID. Um, the, the other thing is that the response was so slow. And like mm -hmm. our areas, uh, there was no recognition that the best people to deliver the messages are in fact local mm. elders, uh, Riverbank Frank, for example, in Dubbo. Frank, Frank Doolan, um, yes, was even <laughs> name checked by the Prime Minister. <laughs> yeah, um, and that did not happen. Um, police represent something very different to, uh, to Aboriginal people than to, um, to, to many others. And it's not necessarily um, a, a, a positive thing mm. all the time. And just finally, you know, the, the, the crisis out in Western New South Wales and far Western New South Wales is now emerging in other places in this state, including a couple of kilometres from where we're sitting now, Redfern, mm. Waterloo and Glebe. Mm. Just a quick one on this, Dave Sharma. Um, when we talk about opening up um, and we talk about hitting 70% or 80% of people over 16, whatever that may be, can you open up when you still have low vaccination rates amongst potentially most vulnerable communities? Should we be thinking even more broadly about what opening up means and who's exposed? Well, I think this raises a broader point, Stan, and that opening up's not... It's not, a, it's not a binary action. We're not going to be, you know, go from one state one day to another mm. another. It's going to be a progressive, incremental and at times a reversible process. And partly reaching certain vaccination rates um, will, you know, open the next gate, but we'll need to still have high measures in place for vulnerable communities, communities with a lower level of protection, be they Indigenous communities, aged care facilities, any number of things. Um, and it's going to be some considerable time and that's... Uh, on the assumption that there's no new variant emerges before mm. we're ever back to something completely normal. So, you know, it's important to have these signposts on the way, 70% and 80%, but let's not kid ourselves that suddenly, once we hit that thing, everything changes. It's not going to happen important. like that. And, and, of course, Linda, you know, we have to, have to acknowledge the enormous work that's being done in those communities now by Aboriginal medical services as well in getting just those vaccinations yeah. into uh, people's arms. The, the Aboriginal medical services have been... Yeah. Astounding, and I, I guess the last point I'd make, Stan, is that it is just frightening to me that when you have a look at all the social justice messages mes measures for Aboriginal people, uh, they are the worst. And I hope that this mm. is not another example of that. Our next question comes from Chu Lin Nguyen. Christina Keneally has been installed in a safe Labor seat, displacing a local candidate, a Vietnamese Australian lawyer who has lived in the community and served that community. Why do all Australian political parties have a diversity problem? And what message does this send to young, talented people of colour who may now be turned off from joining party politics? Mariam, does politics have a diversity problem? Oh. <clears throat> Hell yes, it does. <laughs> um, look, for me... Uh, this There's a bit of diversity <laughs> here tonight in politics, I, have, I must say. There is, but I'm not running for parliament. Um, <laughs> so, look, the point I'd Can make on this... <laughs> <laughs> the point I'd make on this is that, first of all, as was noted by the questioner, this is... The Labor Party doesn't have a monopoly on this issue of having diversity. Uh, uh, you know, frankly, from a female perspective, um, you know, the Labor Party is doing far better than others. Noting, however that there is a bit of a pecking order here when it comes to diversity. When it comes to culturally diverse women, there is an intersectional um, identity there. And time and time again, whether it's in Parliament, and the stats are sober, sobering in this regard, whether it's in Parliament, whether it's in the top echelons of Australian society, what we find is culturally diverse women, like me, um, you know, they don't... They, there's a proportionate under-representation. And, and it's the same issue in Fowler. Um, we're talking about an elect 
electorate um, that is incredibly diverse um, and it, this is just a missed opportunity and frankly there was I think another piece that came out about someone else sharing their experiences. This is a very common issue amongst culturally diverse mm. women in particular and we need to tackle it. it Parliament has to be representative and it's not like the way people see diversity is this uh, idea of like a, a sprinkling of diversity like the way that you'd perhaps put some salt on your mm. chips. That's not what we need. We need critical mass. Yes, I think it was Anne Alley who said diversity is more than wearing a sari or eating Kung Pao chicken. Precisely. Um, but uh, <laughs> just, just to choose a question as well, she said that Christina Keneally has been installed. She hasn't yet, Linda, but it does raise this issue, issue of how can Christina Keneally, um, who does not come from there, uh, represent those, Fowler better than a local Vietnamese woman um, who comes from that community? Can I, I'll come to that, but can I just say, <laughs> can I just say that diversity is more than uh, cultural heritage? Of course. Diversity is people with disability. Exactly. Mm. Diversity is gay people. Yep. Uh, diversity is not just, uh, uh, you know, about your ethnic diversity. Now let's come. Let's come okay. to this. So, How does Christina <laughs> Keneally better suit? than a local Vietnamese woman who was who was looking to be installed in that in that in that uh, seat. Look, politics is contested. Um, sometimes you like the outcome, and sometimes you don't. Uh, I have known Christina Keneally for longer than anyone else in Canberra. Two thousand and three, we were both elected on the same day, and she is a talented, competent. Uh, very important part of but the But Linda, party. This, this is about a deal. She was in the Senate, she was being moved down the yeah. ticket. Let's find a convenient seat for someone who's been moved down the Senate ticket to keep her in the Parliament at someone else's expense. This is a deal. Ah, uh, well, there's lots of deals in politics, Stan. Um, and in relation to diversity, I'm, a, I'm an example of diversity in the Australian Labor Party. And how long did it take to get the first Aboriginal person elected to the woman elected to the House of Representatives? 157 years. Um, I That's don't. The issue, though, don't you? Think? I, I don't. Yes, it it's is. It's taken issue. too long. We can't. But afford diversity to is something that the Labor Party gets, and it is. Uh, it is right, Marion. It, Marion, it, it takes a long time, but can I, I can assure you. Uh, that this has been a healthy discussion. Carl, how do you feel as a Labor mayor? Look, I'm, uh, I'm, I understand that all political parties, Labor, Liberal and all of them need to do better when we uh, have people elected to Parliament that represent multicultural Australia, represent the communities um, full of people of different backgrounds. But necessarily, I mean, frankly, we're quite... We're, we're all Australian and I think it's important um, that the people of Fowler have someone that's going to be able to... Well, they'll make to, the final decision. To, to, ..to fight for them, to make sure that um, their concerns, their aspirations... But they're only going to get to choose the candidate that the party decides Correct. is the right candidate. They're not yeah. getting to make a decision on who else. It is called pre-selection. <laughs> it is, but that, that's the choice they're going to get. Stand. The question here is, wh who is making that choice? Then the party's making that choice at the end of the day. We, the party puts up the pre-selection candidates and Christina will be a fantastic member for Fowler should she get elected. Stand She'll be able to take Jeff. the aspirations to, to Canberra um, to help those people and, and the concerns that they have. She'll, she was the Premier of New South Wales. She understands multicultural communities in, in New South Wales. She's a senator for New South Wales. No, this isn't about Christina Keneally per se. There is a bigger issue at play here and I appreciate this is a really tricky terrain for any political party but there is an opportunity here to send a broader message around cultural diversity. About 4% of federal MPs are from a non-European background. <clears throat> Sorry, 4% mm -hmm. in Parliament but about 20% outside of Parliament. That's not proportionate representation. Time and time again and she Julie is a, a fantastic candidate. This is not about Christina Keneally's competence. Of course she's competent. This is about the broader message that this 
sense. You can't aspire to be what you can't see. And when we look at Parliament, you're in, there's incredible examples of diversity, absolutely. But when we look at Parliament, we look at the top echelons of Australian society, that representation is simply not there and we can do better. And this is an opportunity for the Labor Party and I, would, I wish they would take it. Dave Sharma. Look, I'm, I'm not going to get involved in Labor Party <laughs> politics. Ultimately, that's between <laughs> the Labor Party and the people for Fowler. But, I, I look, I completely signed up to the broader point here that the parliament needs to look more like modern-day Australia, and it doesn't. Uh, let's be honest. Um, and, you know, we all have a duty as parties but also as elected representatives and, you know, leaders of a sort to make sure that we encourage people to get into parliament who don't fit the normal mould, um, whether we mentor people from a diverse background in whatever way... Um, and encourage them to get into but public Julie life. But Julie was mentored. She, all of mm. those things happened, but she can't even pass that initial yeah. hurdle. And this is where the policy makers come into play, yes. and this is why we should have cultural diversity targets. Well, John Lee, this panel tonight um, is a bit of a tick for diversity, I have to say. Um, but j j just to get the, the final word from you on this, uh, we can talk about diversity and we can talk about ticking boxes. Um, there's also the question about whether you get the right people. Um, where do we draw the line in, in representation and diversity and also getting the best representation for people? Well, I, I think you start by not reducing someone to one thing. Look, I'm ethnically Chinese Malaysian. I'm very proud I'm Chinese Malaysian. That's not, who, that's not all that I am. I would like to see more Chinese Malaysian people in Parliament, but I wouldn't vote for someone just because they were Chinese Malaysian. Mm. Mm. I would want to ask what else they want to do, how they think, what their temperament is and so on, whether, essentially where they make a good candidate. I, haven't, I don't know Tuli at all, so I have no idea what kind of candidate she is. But I would note that a lot of the commentary in the media has just focused on her ethnic background, mm. and I think it needs to be about more than that. Yeah, yeah. Good, point. good point to finish on. Thank you all again for being Thank part you. of this. That's all we have time for. Thanks to our panel, Marion Vazade, Dave Sharma, John Lee, Linda Burney and Cal Asfor. And thank you as well for all of your questions. Next week, we're live in Sydney with... This will be really good. A science spectacular with Nobel laureate Brian Schmidt, quantum physicist Michael Bechik, AI expert Toby Walsh, and wildlife scientist Vanessa Perotta. I'm going to go away and really get myself <laughs> read up about it. <laughs> it's a chance to forget COVID for just a moment and to expand your mind. In the meantime, until then, stay safe. Thanks for watching. Have a great night.